Okay, welcome to the final session of Sustainable Infrastructure, Putting Principles into Practice. We are delighted to have everybody with us. Please take a moment and uh, rename yourself. I will do my name in just a moment. Uh, we were, are hoping to have a longer uh, interactive session today. And so we definitely want folks to have their um, affiliations or country next to their names. So welcome to the final session of Sustainable Infrastructure, putting principles into practice. I usually show this slide very quickly, but since this is the last session, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge all of the partner institutions that have put on this year long webinar series, the Sustainable Infrastructure Partnership, Duke University's Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions, the UN Environment Program, Conservation International, uh, the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure or ICSI, ITACOF from the French Ministry of Ecological Transitions, the Green Gray Community of Practice, and finally, Project ECHO. So um, we have, as usual, just a couple of rules. Uh, since this is the last session, I've trimmed them down, but just to acknowledge that this session is being recorded and your attendance is consent to be recorded. As I said, please rename yourself on Zoom. We will have one final certificate of attendance for those who fill out the survey. And this is the survey that we are sending out is for the entire series. We really, really welcome your comments, not just on today's session, but on the any of the sessions that you were able to attend. So um, just quickly, as we sum up today's session, we are going to first do an overview and review what we've talked about for the last year. And that fits very much with uh, this, first, um, this first objective, which is exchanging knowledge. We also are gonna talk about looking forward. And part of that really focuses on not just exchanging knowledge in the future, but really trying to solidify this community of practice for sustainable infrastructure. So we very much look forward to getting your feedback from the last year, but in particular, helping us understand what you all think would be helpful in moving forward. We, this is not just about having interactive sessions, but also what resources would be helpful to you. And on that note, I do wanna point out that we are building out that library related to this webinar series. This is, um, the link should be in the chat, but we now have recordings for all of the sessions. And also uh, we have virtually completed uh, write-ups of all of the case studies. And so you'll be hearing more about them from Rowan in just a moment. But we want to not just have a community of practice, but have the information and the tools available and later in this session today, we wanna sort of have a conversation about what really would be most helpful. So as I said, we are on the final session. It's um, amazing. We started last year on May 12th, just this is our 365th day. And so, oops, I am at this point going to um, hand the mic over to one of our um, colleagues and partners, Rowan Palmer, who is at the UN Environment Program. So Rowan. Thank you very much, Liz. And hello, everybody. If you just yep. bear yeah. with me while I share my screen, I think you should all be able to see that. Uh, tell me if not, but if I don't hear anything, I'll assume yes. Um, so yeah, my uh, presentation here is just to do a quick recap of what we've covered in the series and um, go over a couple of the, the key takeaways that hopefully can, can help us and inform us moving forward. Um, so the series, as we know, was structured around 
the International Good Practice Principles for Sustainable Infrastructure. Um, just a quick update on those. Uh, the principles were originally published in February 2021. Since then, uh, they have been endorsed by the UN Environment Management Group, which is a UN system-wide um, coordination mechanism for environmental issues. And uh, getting the, the uh, EMG endorsement required a few minor changes and updates. So we've just uh, included those in a second edition of the principles that is now uh, available online with, yeah, just the minor updates. Um, and the other big update is that the principles were recognized by all UN member states in a new resolution at the fifth UN Environment Assembly at the beginning of March this year. Um, so that is, is great. It provides us with a, a sort of a broader uh, and stronger mandate uh, for continuing this work over the coming years and, and particularly for helping uh, support countries in implementing these principles and, and putting them into practice. So, just to quickly summarize, these are 10 principles. They're designed uh, primarily to help policymakers take needs-based systems level integrated approaches to planning and delivering sustainable infrastructure. They apply to the whole infrastructure life cycle and you can see the, the diet life cycle diagram here, uh, all the way from strategic planning through to design, construction, operations, decommissioning, but there is a strong focus on the enabling environment and on the planning phases that occur upstream of any single project. So, the way the series has been structured, each principle ha has had its own webinar and for each uh, for each of those principles, we featured uh, one or sometimes two case studies that illustrate uh, key aspects of the principles. So for the first principle on strategic planning, we had two cases, one on a strategic environmental assessment of a hydropower project in Azad Jammu and Kashmir, and another one on assessing sustainable infrastructure capacity in the Gambia. Uh, for principle two on responsive, flexible, and resilient, resilient service provision, we had a case looking at Cape Town's approach to municipal water resilience during a time of drought from 2015 to 2018. Principle three on life cycle assessment, we had a case on landscape scale planning in Mongolia. For principle four on avoiding environmental impacts and investing in nature, we heard about an integrated green gray solution to protect the Cienaga Grande in Colombia. For principle five on research efficiency and circularity, we learned about Singapore's green buildings program. For principle six on equity, inclusiveness and empowerment, we had a case on affordable and sustainable wash solution in India at the community level in India. For principle seven on enhancing economic benefits, we had a case study of the Nam Tin Tu hydropower project in Laos. For principle eight on fiscal sustainability and innovative financing, we had a case study on Kenya's green bond issuance, which was, I believe, the first uh, such issuance in East Africa. On principle nine, on transparent, inclusive, and participatory decision making, we had a case on engaging stakeholders uh, through participatory scenario planning in Peru. And finally, in our most recent uh, session from last month on evidence based decision making, we had cases on urban strategies for climate resilience in New York and Rotterdam. As Liz said, uh, anybody interested in, in revisiting these or, or checking them out for the first time can find and uh, find them on the series website. Um, so what I'll quickly go through now is across all of the webinars and the case studies, there were a few themes that emerged that we just like to highlight uh, now before we move on. Um, the first First is, is really the, the complexity of the interlinkages between the different aspects of sustainable infrastructure. One case as an example, and we'll use the, uh, the case from India on the sustainable wash and waste management solution. It was used to illustrate principle six on inclusiveness and empowerment because it created uh, a lot of employment opportunities for women in the community um, where the project happened. 
But, you know, looking into it, we could find other connections as well. Uh, it also relates to resource efficiency and circularity because there was a solid waste management component um, that, that increased uh, recycling rates of solid waste. Uh, it relates to job creation in the community. It relates to uh, fiscal sustainability because the project managed to have 100% cost recovery through uh, combination of user fees and sale of recyclables and other measures. Um, it relates also to evidence-based decision-making and public participation because the project engaged the local community to collect accurate data about, about waste generation. Um, and, and this also helped to, to generate community support for the project. So this is just one of the cases, but if we go through this exercise for all of them, we can pretty quickly see that there's, there's a lot of links from each case to the different principles. This image here is only just showing the primary link plus an additional two. But if we went through all the cases in detail, we could probably find links to, to every single one of the principles in each of the cases. So this just really um, underlines the need for uh, integrated approaches that, that consider sustainability of infrastructure in, in a holistic and, and a systematic way. way. Um, the other two sort of main themes that emerge the most strongly that I'll mention now are at number one, the need for early intervention and, and early planning. Um, and number two, the need for public and stakeholder participation. And, and really both of these relate to being able to identify risks and opportunities as early as possible in the planning cycle and then plan a accordingly when the broadest range of solutions are, are still available and feasible from, uh, from a political, technical, or economic standpoint, um, i.e. There's, there's no sort of path dependency yet um, of, of having gone down a, a certain route. Um, and so if we look at the 10 principles here uh, and the life cycle diagram, you know, some of them relate primarily to, to one phase or another, and some of them at first glance may um, look more relevant for, you know, design or, or financing or constructions or operations phases, but really all of them in, in one way or another relate back uh, to the upstream phases of the life cycle. So, I mean, strategic planning is fairly self-evident, but if we look at principle two on, on responsive uh, service provision, you know, this really requires uh, planners to understand what the service needs are from the beginning so, so that uh, they can plan accordingly. Um, looking at uh, principle four, avoiding environmental impacts. Obviously, this is easiest if you understand what they are as early as possible. Um, something like principle five, resource efficiency and circularity. Uh, you know, at first glance, this, this may seem to relate more to, to the design phase or construction, but if you think about um, resource efficiency, uh, for example, and improving resource efficiency through the use of uh, recycled or reclaimed construction materials, for example, yes, this needs to happen in, in the design and during construction, but in order in order for those things to be incorporated there, you have to already have the enabling environment. So you would need to have, uh, you know, uh, standard specifications for the use of those materials included in, in the building codes and, and design codes and things like that. So it really does relate back uh, to the enabling environment. And for that one in particular as well, procurement is a, is a particularly important phase because uh, the use of those kinds of materials needs to be uh, incentivized. And then looking at uh, principle nine on public particip participation, um, this, this was really uh, one of the, the key themes that emerged is how important public participation is and stakeholder engagement for the success and sustainability of projects. And for this to be effective, it needs to be done uh, early from, from the early stages of planning uh, and continued throughout. And it's extremely important um, not just for ensuring uh, support for projects, uh, but also for, for understanding those service needs, understanding the risks, and being able to, to deal with them effectively. Um, so I will stop there. I think uh, if any of the other organizers uh, has any takeaways that they'd like to add, please go ahead. But I will
we'll hand it back to Liz at this point. Liz. Thank you, Rowan. Um, we are going to take a moment to uh, do a poll before we move on. We are going to um, change things up a little by asking you to do a Zoom poll today and not mentee. Uh, which principle, which principles that Rowan just mentioned are most relevant to your work? And if you wouldn't mind selecting up to four, and we will show the results in just a moment. Okay, they're coming in. All right, and then we are gonna have a second poll after we show these results. So if everyone can be ready. All right. Ah. Sarah, do you wanna show the results for us? I cannot see them, but um, <laughs> see something different on my screen. But uh, interestingly, the avoiding environmental impacts and investing in nature seems to be the biggest, uh, most popular, but there's a little bit of everything. Strategic planning is, is clearly big. It's good that a lot of you here are interested in the avoiding environmental impacts and investing in nature, because later today we are gonna talk about one of our uh, activities going forward, which matches this quite nicely, but really the equity inclusiveness and empowerment, fiscal sustainability evidence, really uh, there's a little bit from all of them. So why don't we go to the second poll? And this is um, now, The second poll is looking back for those of you who were with us in one or more sessions, which element of the series uh, would you allocate more time to? There were sort of four sections during each one of our sessions. Um, the introductions like Rowan just did of the principles, a presentation by a specialist on a tool or a model, the case studies, and then the discussion sections. So again, if you could take a moment, this is just helpful for us thinking about for, for future sessions going forward. Um, and it looks like it's, it's pretty much a horse race here. All right. Well, it looks like the tools and the specialist was, uh, particularly important, followed closely by the case studies and the breakout. And now you can go back and look at um, the UNEP presentations. They're all online. So that is great. So what I want to do now is um, we're going to have a little bit more of a look back and discussion of what we've seen. The first thing we want to, the next thing we want to do is when we started a year ago, one of the things we did was we, um, we met up, we had a, a conversation with um, one of the participants, Billy Javetti, who is uh, at University of New Mexico. And Billy is uh, also involved in Kenya, where he is from, helping develop a, um, a rural health clinic in Western Kenya called the Felbaum Health Center. And one of the things that they were hoping to do a year ago when they were in the early stages of development and construction was to um, really focus on the sustainability of both the center and the lands around it and the interactions with the community. We had a conversation a year ago with Billy about what the barriers were and what he hoped he could get from this webinar. And earlier this week, we had the opportunity to touch base with him and I am going to show, I think Billy may be joining us today, but we're gonna show a quick, a couple minute uh, video clip of a conversation. I started by asking Billy if he could just update us on the health center and also uh, indicate uh, if there were 
things that he received from our year long session that were helpful to him. So, um, and before we, yeah, I wanna turn to that um, webinar now. Or the yes, now, very please. much. Thank you for having me again. It's been a tremendous year on my end learning and gaining new insights. When we met last year, uh, we were implementing an environmental impact assessment for the health center that had glaring gaps. We did not know how to deal with the issue of uh, heavy rains, runoff uh, from the roof and the roads into people's farms onto our property. And then that aspect of balancing community needs for water versus those of uh, small scale gold miners who are rampant in the community and are taking every available space of water to purify their sand as they prospect for gold. And this was going to put us into a conflict with the gold miners. Um, so Billy, did anything that came up during the sessions help you think about how you all could deal with these issues? Absolutely. I was able to travel to Kenya between uh, June and September 2021. I met with a team of engineers and a technical development uh, expert. We did a technical assessment. One of the things that was recommended was uh, a hydrological survey and also a geologic survey to establish if it is possible to sink a well onto the property as well as how to be able to locate and balance the needs of the community. All this is part of the information uh, that I gathered and gleaned from these webinars. And um, what sessions in particular did you find helpful? I was able to benefit from the session uh, number one on the session number nine or principle number nine sustainable infrastructure, uh, sorry, sustainable infrastructure, transparent, inclusive, and participatory decision-making. Uh, this uh, principle was basically addressing how to uh, be able to put the stakeholders together. It was mainly emphasizing the aspect of uh, what they refer to as participatory scenarios. In my case, the problem of clean water supply and dealing a potential conflict with the gold miners enabled me to be able to learn how to bring all the stakeholders together. I've been able to reach out to uh, the Kenya Forest uh, Service Managers, uh, engineers on the ground, and also the community leaders to be able to come up with a, a pool of people. We have expanded and recruited other researchers from the US, including Bowling Green, State University, we are working on a proposal that we intend to submit to the National Science Foundation that will yield additional financial resources to be able to enable us implement uh, principle number nine, that of integrating uh, the stakeholders. The other one that I did benefit greatly from was in generating capital from our natural resources. Like I mentioned earlier on, we live close to the only tropical rainforest in Kenya. And the way it is being utilized or used does not amount to natural capital. There's been a lot of cases whereby the forest is being uh, destroyed. So in the presentation, even though it was customized to the US audience, all the principles it was talking about uh, the value of ecosystem services, that is something that I intend to export to this community and to my country. That is that is uh, wonderful. Um, Billy, as we think about going forward with this series and think about um, new audiences or, or new themes or issues to work on, do you have any suggestions that you think would be helpful? Sure, I have benefited uh, personally as a researcher, as an expert, I would uh, highly recommend now uh, taking this uh, to the level below us, that is the students, uh, undergraduate, uh, graduate uh, level, you know, of learning, because we have 
benefited from experts in the UN, in academia, in practice. A lot of students may not have been uh, private to what we were discussing here. I would love to see maybe the next phase of this target undergraduates or graduate students, because these are students who live in their own communities and provoking them to come up with solutions to the problems in their own communities would be one way of uh, sustaining this knowledge and of course, solving the myriad of problems existing in the environment out there. Okay, well, thank you, Billy. That was great. And I also want to say Billy is involved with another project, ECHO, which we'll talk about in a moment, another hub called the Peace Engineering ECHO. And I know there's several other people, um, Hillman Mitchell and Romero Jordan, and I don't see Donna here today, but we've had other people from this different hub that have joined a lot of this series. And it's a, another group that we can really, I think, work together with um, to in, in our next stage. So let's go ahead and take a look at, um, at the series in a glance. And I am sharing my screen again. So um, over this last year in the uh, 12 sessions that we've held, 400, 642 separate individuals have participated online, representing 71 countries, and that's an underestimate because of the way the data is collected. Uh, and we have had almost 2,500 views of the recording of the different webinars online. And this is just to show you the um, the broad coverage of people who have participated in our live webinars. And in those post surveys that you all um, filled out afterwards, just a couple of highlights, 97% of the individuals answering them said that they definitely probably or possibly uh, would use what they learned in their work. And 65% of those said they would definitely use what they learned in their work. 99% definitely probably or possibly said they would recommend this series to a colleague. And of those 65 said they would definitely recommend it. So we were really pleased. And again, we hope to get more feedback from you all after this uh, over the concerning the course of the whole webinar. So who was attending? This is um, the affiliation people gave and uh, Perhaps not surprising for those of you who have come, we consistently after the first couple have had a strong uh, participation by engineers, architects, or people in construction enterprise, but also a lot of folks from government and from NGOs, and then a smattering of pretty much everything else. And we asked what uh, sector people felt most associated with. And again, this really, I, about half the people almost were involved in multiple sectors. So um, as I just mentioned, and uh, as you know, if you have been joining us from the beginning, the model that we based on was borrowed from the um, from the health the health field, a group called Project Echo, which has been around for about twelve years developed a model to be able to reach people in uh, rural areas that couldn't doc that couldn't get access to medical care because there weren't enough trained doctors in remote areas. And about a dozen years or so, they developed a, um, a method where they would build communities of practice with healthcare providers. And the key pieces of each of these is that they would use essentially um, Zoom, which was 12 years ago. Um, they were already doing virtual learning and that was very progressive at the time. They were very well uh, prepared for these last two years, but critically they used, they were sharing best practices 
uh, online and also when possible in person with these small hubs of groups and using case-based learning, uh, which they would then monitor and go back and refine. And this program turned out to be this model extremely successful. They now have 750 of these hubs, like the hub we've done this last year. And these hubs have done over a thousand programs based in 62 different countries. So to just give you a sense of the growth, this is the growth in the number of new hubs. And you can see these last couple of years, they were very well positioned to expand and address issues of COVID. Uh, and this is the number of uh, people attending these different ECHO hubs. Over a million people the last two years have been involved each year in different programs. So the way the ECHO program works is it's really very um, intersectional. They try within an individual hub, bring people who have to work together but might have different uh, come from, from different fields. And then an individual hub might, for example, be involved with chronic pain or rheumatoid arthritis or substance abuse. And these may be the same people in different hubs or they may all focus uh, on one. And this, was, this is the model that we have developed with this, uh, this um, our sustainable infrastructure hub, but what we're trying to think about now is um, how we might move forward, um, sort of building on what we've learned in the last year, but also thinking about bringing together different groups and focusing on either different themes, different types of infrastructure or different geographies. So for example, one could imagine a group focused specifically on low carbon development, but across different infrastructure sectors and bringing in these different groups of engineers and planners and NGOs and government um, folks. We might focus on green grain infrastructure. In fact, that program is already um, moving forward and we're gonna hear more about that in just a moment. We might have a, a bigger theme, which again, crosses a couple other themes, crossing different uh, groups such as resilience and adaptation or green finance. The In our programs, as you've heard from Rowan, we have focused on these 10 principles because they, over, they underlie a lot of these different themes. And so we're looking at how we might incorporate all these into moving forward. So with that in mind, I want to uh, introduce first um, uh, our next speaker who's gonna talk to us about a, uh, a new hub that is forming right now, actually two new hubs that is forming from one of the partners that have been involved um, in this series, Conservation International and the Green Gray, uh, the Green Gray Community of Practice. And I am Will Peterson, just pulling up Will's intro. He's gonna introduce the Green Gray Hub and he is um, with Conservation International. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Will. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I'm gonna share the screen. So that's coming through. I just wanted to start off with a really quick background on Green Gray. Um, while I, I'm sure the group has a lot of familiarity with gray and with green, um, this is meant to illustrate the spectrum um, that includes green gray, um, which, which in a lot of ways draws on the best of those kind of end pieces to create a hybrid solution. Um, if you are interested in learning more about green gray, um, you can refer back to the September session on principle four that included that case study that Rowan mentioned on green gray in the Cienega Grande. Um, Conservation International, in partnership with other leading organizations, established the Green Gray Community of Practice um, about two years ago, and it's intended to expand the implementation of Green Gray infrastructure. What we did when we set out was identify kind of four main hubs or four main kind of areas that we wanted to work on advancing. So you can see innovate and pilot global awareness as part of those two. Um, 
And um, the upcoming hub that Elizabeth touched on um, is really focused on expanding that global awareness. Um, the Community of Practice has launched a year-long webinar that'll meet monthly. Um, it's called the Sustainable Infrastructure Putting Principles into Practice. Um, to date, there's been 500 participants from 80 countries. Um, and really the conversation is aimed at making sure that ecosystem restoration and conservation is really part of the conversation when it comes to sustainable infrastructure. So in terms of the upcoming events, um, we've got two of them um, that are focused on coastal resilience. Um, one of them is um, based or focused in the Americas. The others is in Asia Pacific. Um, Sarah will, will post the link in the chat um, for folks interested in registering for the event. But the Asia, Asia Pacific event is on May 25th at 9 p.m. Eastern. And the Americas is June 29th at 9 a.m. Eastern. And um, as you can see here, it's, it's really focused on identifying case studies in green gray um, that um, folks are willing to share with the group um, to kind of provide a wide range of applications, geographies, and scale of projects, and then to help empower others um, in, in their kind of future green gray projects. So with that, Elizabeth, um, I'll hand it back to you, I believe. Okay, um, let me share my screen. So I want to um, now introduce our next speaker. Um, hold on just a moment. I'm not as good at getting going back and forth. Um, so um, and I'll drop my email in the chat if anyone has questions or, or wants to reach out at all. Okay, so Leia Balavon is um, in is going to introduce our next program, which Leia is an engineer and an environmental economist, and right now she is working with one of the other partners on this webinar series in the Ministry of Ecological Transitions of France in Itakoff, which focuses on trans sustainable transportation. And Leia is gonna to talk to us about a perspective hub that we are putting together right now on, um, on sustainable transportation. And I am going to share the screen for Leia. Hold on. Leia, go ahead while I am, uh, ah. Okay, thanks. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So in order to announce uh, this other hub that we are planning on doing, we wanted to introduce you to the Bison Project. Uh, so the Bison Project uh, was funded by the European Union and uh, is gathering 16 countries and 39 partners. So BISON, as you can see, stands for Biodiversity and Infrastructure Synergies and Opportunities for European Transport Networks. And it is a research and innovation program uh, aiming to identify the best practices in order to integrate biodiversity into the development of transport infrastructure. So when we're talking about transport infrastructure, we're talking about roads, railways, waterways, airports, ports, uh, but also energy transport networks. So the findings of uh, the program uh, yet need to be disseminated and uh, this can be done through three actions. So first of all, by bringing together a multidisciplinary community of stakeholders, including the industry, the public sector, the transport authorities, the academic sector, uh, to understand and fill out the gaps and barriers uh, to applying those uh, best practices. Secondly, of course, communicating on sustainable transportation research and the results of this research. And um, finally, by training uh, the different stakeholders uh, regarding those uh, good practices. So this is why we want to create a hub on uh, sustainable transport infrastructure following the ECHO model. Um, so this would be throughout a three month uh, case-based learning webinar, which we're hoping to launch uh, in the fall. 
and uh, throughout which we would still be using as a common thread the UNEP's uh, 10 good principles that we saw throughout this webinar series. So however, we are still wondering how broad uh, the scope of this community should be uh, if we want to keep our focus on transportation infrastructure and biodiversity, if we want to enlarge this to environmental considerations, or if we want to have an even wider approach and discuss transportation and sustainable development. So please feel free to discuss this in the breakout session later and uh, give us your input on the matter. Thank you. Thank you, Leia. That was great. Um, all right, so we are going to wrap up this section and I wanna introduce Savina Carluccio, who is from ICSI, again, another one of our partners running this uh, series. And so Savina, over to you and I'll put up the breakout sessions. Great, right. thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, what is left to do, I think for the last, uh, um, webinar of this series uh, is to introduce the breakout sessions and that's your, your opportunity to share with us uh, your thoughts on where we might be going next and what's been useful so far. So we've got a series of questions so that you can see them on the screen. Um, so one is about reviewing the series that we are just concluding. Um, so what, what have you found useful and valuable? Uh, how could we change it to make it even more useful? Um, and then we just be looking at the future and then, you know, to just get your, your feedback on and your thoughts on what might uh, be uh, future topics that we want to explore and future audiences, you know, would you make any changes to the format? Um, what else could, could help you in your day jobs to put these sustainable infrastructure principles in practice? Um, and then uh, what else can you, can you also gain in the future from, from sessions that are even more improved than, uh, than our current one? And then finally, um, a bit of feedback on whether you would like to engage um, actively in, in, a, in a community of practice that we've uh, started to build with this webinar series and uh, we we've got a pretty loyal uh, following and we hope uh, that this is uh, growing uh, and that you could, can keep on being part of, of our uh, knowledge sharing initiatives so and with that um, we hope you will stay for the breakout sessions we will now you now uh, be sent to different breakout rooms um, and then look forward to coming back at the end of it uh, for the final uh, remarks from Liz. Welcome back, everyone. Um, thank you for sticking with us. We are going to wrap this up in just a couple of minutes. But um, before we get to our final um, conversation and remarks, I want to, first of all, thank Sarah Mason, who um, has been behind the scenes for the entire year. And this whole series would definitely not have worked if Sarah had not brilliantly been uh, been orchestrating everything. And Sarah is not going to put on her camera right now because she has um, COVID and is still back here working. She's getting over a pretty tough run of it. So thank you, Sarah. And thank you for all of our um, uh, other folks who've been involved, and I'm not going to go over all the names because you've seen most of them. Emily Corwin was not able to join us today, but Emily has been um, terrific as well. So thank you all. Next thing is I want to um, I want to make sure that you all have the link to the post uh, the post series survey. We are also going to send this link out tomorrow when we send out, or later this week when we send out the recording. So please, please uh, do fill that out. But also, uh, if you have comments that are not captured in that, feel free to contact any of us. So the final thing, I have um, a whole series of notes from my breakout of great ideas. And um, we'll stay online for a few more minutes for those of you who can, who, who want to stay on and didn't get to say things. But what we are especially interested in knowing is if there are folks in this group that either 
are interested in actually helping start a smaller hub or have a topic that they really would like to keep um, involved in and, and launch this further. Or if you just wanna be involved and wanna, we're gonna keep, you're on our list, we will keep sending you announcements for hubs as they start up and move forward. But if you have ideas uh, or your institution, these are not, we don't have to run these ourselves. We can also link up, or if you have a program that you're starting that we can combine with and help sort of push people towards you, that's great because the whole idea is really to develop this community where we can share knowledge and sort of move, move the needle on sustainable infrastructure across lots of, um, lots of different areas. So I'm going to thank you all for coming and ask if any of the other organizers have any last words they want to say. Rowan, I know Savina had to leave from ICSI, but um, so we will stay online. Oh, Rowan, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to, you know, echo your thanks to everyone for for joining and and also thank you, Liz, for your, uh, you know, your your leadership in, in every one of the uh, sessions and, and just a, a great job. So thanks very much. And Yannick, who um, hasn't been uh, hasn't been talking, but he has been also very instrumental in helping um, form this series and also uh, sending us some fantastic interns uh, over the years. Some of you might remember Anna from the beginning. Um, so thank you also to Yannick. All right, so that formally ends this session. We will stick around for a few more minutes in case anybody has some more ideas or questions that they want to um, bring up or, um, you know, if you've got a hub that you're dying to move forward, um, please stay on and chat, but um, please fill out our survey and um, thank you all for joining us.